big problem today, the World Bank estimates that while more than two thirds of adult population have got access to you know, banking and mobile you know, money accounts, there's 1.7 billion that, of adults that actually are unbanked, don't have access to, don't have to banking, which means you, if you don't have access to banking, uh, it means you can't get your you know, financial assistance, if you're a small business, you can't get uh, access to uh, potentially borrowing and transact, so it's critical. You know, when you think about it, blockchain could be quite dramatically important for financial inclusion because outside of the formal financial sector, you know, what is happening uh, with blockchain is the ability to create new types of digital financial products like decentralized bank accounts, for example. Uh, and then even within the existing financial sector, you know, what we can see is you can integrate low income financial excluded populations by creating alternative indicators of behavior that can be used to assess the risk to the consumers. And then internationally, blockchain is attractive in that it can actually use, for example, to facilitate remittances to migrants. We're seeing that as well as business models, right, using distributed ledger to transfer small amounts of money overseas. So we're already seeing business models develop that actually help bring greater financial inclusion through actually allowing transfers, allowing people who don't have bank accounts unbanked. At the end of the day, the technology itself is fundamentally democratized. You know, it's distributed and it's shared. Nothing else could be more democratic, right? So if you think about three points, right? First of all, you know, blockchain provides users with full transparency because the data and any changes to the data are visible by all parties that are allowed access. So you can actually, the transparency is amazing. Secondly, in terms of democracy or, you know, confidence, trust, Blocks of data are verified by members of the network and the links between the blocks and their content are protected by cryptopic, 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 cryptography. <laughs> anyway, you'll get that. Um, which means, again, it underpins trust, which is very important in a, demo, in a, if you're in a democracy, right? And then thirdly, um, Again, back to that trust, previous transactions can't be destroyed, forged, amended, which means there is potential for the ledger and transaction to be trusted more, more than centralised databases. Blockchain will disrupt uh, many businesses, uh, including financial services, by disintermediating parties in the value chain. And what we're seeing initially is in clearing and settlement, in payment services, and in financing, three subsectors, okay? And the reason, as I said, is that blockchain offers increased speed, reduced cost, and brings in potentially new players. It eliminates some, but brings in new, creates new opportunities. So there's probably three examples of this. In transaction processes, blockchain, again, cuts out middleman, uh, transaction safer, faster, easily more traceable, very important. Uh, on fraud detection, you know, blockchain, because it's transparent and because it can't be tampered with, then fraudulent payments uh, are unlikely uh, to really occur, okay, because you can see the flow. And um, then thirdly, through smart contracts, uh, you know, they're automated, easily verified, interpreted, uh, and enforced. So essentially, smart contracts reduce paperwork, from a lawyer's perspective, enable organisations to handle and respond quickly, automatically to uh, to transactions. And it's probably likely we're going to see large private networks with assets that are backed by real-world assets that are essentially tokenised. We see that the revolution is going to happen in tokenisation of assets. And so most of those networks, almost all of them, are going to be permission networks. They're not going to be open networks like uh, Bitcoin. Uh, but it's going to bring a huge quantum leap in efficiency and transparency in banking and will probably pave the way for an even more disruptive innovation like central bank digital currencies which are, you know, have been being examined for over a decade. So I think one particular development is China where I think what we're now seeing in, in, in the area of uh, fintech is we're seeing really holistic solutions which actually combine um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the Internet of Things, and blockchain, uh, 
uh, to find solutions for a new generation of financial products. So we're seeing things like in China, automated livestock insurance, which really sort of really brings it all together. And I think we're going to see more and more of this occurring, so people connecting the dots between the real emerging technologies. We're going to continue to monitor the innovations and provide the best advice we can to policymakers and most importantly to our partners in the private sector to make sure that uh, they get it right and they're not frustrated.